Hey girl, my name is Anel. Welcome to the Brave and Her podcast, where we inspire, empower, and motivate by sharing our stories of bravery. I strongly believe that by sharing our stories, we open ourselves to healing, but also serve to give hope and inspiration to those who are dealing with a tough situation. We will talk about all topics under the sun. Now let's hear your stories of bravery. Hello, um, this is Danelle from the Brave and Her podcast. Thank you for um, joining us today. Um, today we have a very special guest. Her name is Morgan Mitchell. And um, she is an educator, but she's here to talk to us about um, dealing in dealing with a toxic environment and how she was so brave enough to just leave and how she is so much happier now. Um, hi, Morgan. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited that you're here as well. And um I just want you to, to, you know, to share your story and hope and hopes to inspire and just push someone else to do the same thing you did. Because I know, you know, just by talking to you earlier today, I'm so inspired and, you know, I don't know, you're pushing me to, to do the same thing. But anyway, if you can just give us um, a little background on, on your story, who you are and um, yeah. All right. So um, like Anel said, my name is Morgan Mitchell and I too have a podcast, Recipes for Happiness. And I am a South Florida girl all the way. I live in Jupiter, Florida, and I love going to the beach. Um, I have a son who is eight and a husband. Um, I've been married for 12 years and I am an educator. I've been in the education field for 15 years I graduated from college and jumped right into becoming a teacher. And um, when I graduated from college, I was so excited. I was just totally pumped to become a teacher. And I got hired um, to work at a school. And I, it was my first job. I was just so excited about this. And when I graduated, obviously, I didn't have... Um, I was dating my husband at the time. And so I had all of this time on my hands to just absorb myself into my career. Um, so I was, I was just so excited about it. And so I started out as a middle school teacher and I, I worked my way kind of through teaching for a couple of years and gradually started working my way up. Um, the ladder, so to speak, into administration at the school. And okay, and um, so you were working there for ten years. Yeah. Can you let us know how um, how it got toxic, and how you know how were you able to, I guess, cope with it in the in, you know in the meantime while you were working there, and um, yeah, and then how. Um, how it got to the point where you said, I can't work there anymore. Okay. So I started working there and let me preface this by saying, I feel like there's a lot of teachers out there or really anybody um, where, for example, I'm a, I'm a workaholic. Like I, I love, I get um, pleasure and I feel good about myself when I know that I'm doing a good job at work. I'm also a people pleaser. So, um, whenever my boss or any colleagues would ask me to do something, it was really hard for me to say no. I always said yes, even though like it might interfere with my date night or something. I always felt like my job took priority. And, and that was part of the way, I guess, that I was raised. Like I was always raised to be self-sufficient. I was always raised to be able to support myself. And because of that, I always felt like I needed to, you know, say yes. And that was the way to kind of not ruffle any feathers, so to speak. And plus I loved where I was working and I loved what I was doing. So as kind of my career started, um, I would involve myself in extracurricular activities at the school. If they had um, any fundraising events, I was always the person that was like heading up 
you know, that fundraising event and I was chairing it. And I just, I wanted to do as much as I could to help the school that I was working at out. Um, and so at first it wasn't really a big deal. Um, my husband or my boyfriend, he's my husband now, but my boyfriend at the time, he was working a lot. And, you know, I just kind of, I felt like, good about the situation. I was like, oh, you know, I'm doing this really good thing. I'm helping my school out. I love being around the kids. Yeah. And so I, I gradually, um, you know, just get kept on getting more and more and more involved. And step by step, as I was getting more involved in my job, I was losing so much of my personal life, but I didn't see that. I didn't see it that way at the time because right. I was, I was becoming more friends with my coworkers. I was kind of building this family where I worked. And um, in the meantime, I was losing like my actual family. I was losing so many of my friends because they were sick of me kind of selling out and not showing up for events and canceling on them. And, um, and things just kind of started spiraling out of control with my job. And I will say that a lot of it, looking back, was like I, I was being taken advantage of, but a lot of it um, kind of was not necessarily my fault, but I was also allowing that to happen. I didn't realize right. it at the time, but that that was happening. Right. Because how you were saying that you just felt good about yourself by, you know, helping and, you know, you're thinking you're doing a, a good thing. You're doing right. a great job and you're, you're helping your students, you're helping your coworkers, you're, you know, you're there involved. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think that feels like, um, like you're accomplishing something. It feels like you're doing a good thing without realizing that, you're giving up so much on your personal side. Right. So everything kind of started to slip with my personal life, but I, I didn't really, I didn't really see that. And my boyfriend at the time, um, who now is my husband, he would start, like, he saw it way before I did. And he would say things just every once in a while, like, you know, you're in your twenties. Like, are you sure that like you want to stay working here. There's so many other schools and, you know, you could, you could maybe make a career change if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like he was crazy. You know, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, everything is fine. I, I was seriously addicted to working there. And, um, and luckily I somehow miraculously was able to keep my relationship with my boyfriend going. And during that time, somehow he still was in love with me. I, looking back, I really have no idea how. And he proposed and we ended up getting married. And, um, and then a couple years later, I became pregnant. And I remember um, when I became pregnant, I was so excited about being pregnant. But at the same time, I was kind of in denial because I was working just as much. I was like my husband and my, my mom and my dad kept saying to me, you know, when you have your son, like things are going to change. And I was like, nothing's going to change. Everything's, I'm going to be able to work and everything's right. going to be fine. And, um, and obviously I was, um, in denial, right? Because that's not right. exactly what happens when you have a child, but I went through my pregnancy. I was working just as much. And then, um, when I had my son, I did, um, I was like, I had a reality check, so to speak, then where I took a little bit of extra time off for maternity leave. And during that time, my husband said to me, you know, like, you don't really have to go back there. Now, this really was a crossroads for me because when he said that to me, I did consider it. I have to be honest with you. I did consider right. not going back um, because at that point I had had about four and a half months away, but that like switch went off in my brain where instead of thinking to myself, like, okay, it's time to be a mom. And, you know, I have to be able to find some balance. It's all about finding balance. And 
when I had, when it was time for me to go back to work, I had this like flip switch in my head where I thought to myself, I have to go back because I've dedicated so much time to this job and I am not ready to give that up yet. And so I made the decision to go back. I made the decision to go back full time. And, um, and I, right within the first week, um, I did hesitate a little bit, but I, I basically fell back into, um, the same mental place that I was in before my son, where I felt like I had to work so much and, um, and the same amount of responsibilities, the expectations, the, you know, even though everybody that I worked with had become my family, I also, um, once I was there back working, I wasn't able to juggle everything properly and I was off balance. But again, I just felt so good about being back at work that I didn't see it myself. Right. Okay. Um, did you, um, like right before ma- maternity or when, no, sorry, when you had your, your, your kid, did you ever feel like, you know, it's okay for me to go back to work. Um, it's okay because I can always talk to my boss and, and see if, you know, I can take a, a step back and, you know, have more time for my kid, but also continue working. So I did actually have a conversation and at the time it was, I felt like we were both on the same page, but what happens sometimes, and this is what happened with me is that I, you have this, this conversation and you feel like everybody's on the same page. And I I do honestly feel like, um, it was the best of intentions, but it, it, and it doesn't happen. Like for me, it was a gradual thing where mm-hmm. like, yeah, things started back slowly and I wasn't, you know, I, I was still working and, and the expectation might've not been as high as previously, but then there's like certain situations that come up and those situations become mm-hmm. more and more and more. And I would say within three or four weeks, I was right back to where I was. So mm-hmm. even though at first, like the intention was there for me to not work as much, um, it, that changed over a course, I would say the three to four weeks and I was right back to where I was. And again, part of it was on them. But a lot of it was on me for allowing that to happen. Right. right. I, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, that, yeah, it might have not been them directly telling you or asking you to take on, you know, extra work. But these situations just so happen to, you know, be there. And, you know, you being the person that you are, that you want to help, you got involved in those situations. And, you know, your I guess your boss just allowed allowed for you to just take on more without saying, no, you know, wait, um, you know, just wait, I'll take care of it. Or we'll find someone else to take care of it. You know, you slow yourself into, you know, full mode again. Right. And luckily, um, somehow I, even though I was dedicating so much time to work, um, Mm -hmm. I wasn't sleeping a lot at the time, but when I would go home, I would try and do the best that I could um, yeah. at working full time and being a mom. And I think that for me, I always felt like I need, and I still do. I feel like I need to do both. Like I am not the type of person. I, I think that being a stay at home mom is such a hard job. I think that it being a parent yeah. is the most difficult job that you could ever have. Um, and I also think that, uh, that moms or dads that decide to be a stay at home parent, that is such an amazing thing to do. But for me, I felt completely off balance. I felt like I had to have a job and also be a mom. And I think that that, that's just part of who I am. And I don't have any shame in that. Um, but at the time that I was in this environment, it was, it was obviously abnormal. It was abnormal because of the way that the school was run. It was Mm -hmm. also abnormal because I think that I'm such a people pleaser. I'm, um, I'm an Enneagram three 
on the Enneagram scale for any listeners out there that know about (laughs) Enneagrams, right? And an Enneagram three is an achiever. And so I'm very goal oriented. And so I always want to do my best with everything. And that, that, that shows with my job as well. So I, um, so I started working back after maternity leave and it took me, I guess my son was about two years old and I had been at work all day. I went to go pick him up from, um, the little home daycare that he was at and I brought him home and I was sitting on the floor in, um, in his bathroom and he was in the bathtub playing and I was playing with him, but I also had my laptop computer. And so I wasn't, I didn't give my full undivided attention to my son. And I was answering emails and playing with him and answering emails and playing with him and talking to him. But I was also obviously working on the floor in the bathroom after being at work all day. And my husband came home and he said to me, you know, Morgan, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, well, I just had to answer a couple of emails while Fisher was taking a bath. And he was like, but you've been at work all day. Like, just give yourself a break and give your son son some undivided attention and pray with him. And, um, and that, that specific situation was where like this whole, like, I just saw like my whole world flash before my eyes. And that was the turning point for sure. That one situation right there where um, I was living in the moment and my husband pointed it out to me as I was going through that, that situation. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of people can relate to that, especially, you know, women and moms that, um, you know, work and, you know, like in your situation where you're working full time and, you know, you're such a, um, I guess, um, people pleaser, you want to, you know, you, you just want to give your best and you just can't separate your, your personal from your, um, from your, you know, your work life and your family life. And you just cannot be present in your family life because you have so much to do for work still. And you just can't be present. You can't be present in either, either situation, because I'm pretty sure while you were at work, you're thinking about your kid too. And, you know, when you're trying to play with your kid, it's, you know, you're thinking about work and you just cannot be fully present. There. Yeah. And that is such a good point because I totally had the mom guilt going every single day when I was at work. Like, even though I felt like that was the right thing for me to be doing and I loved my job, every single second of the day, I also felt torn because I felt Mm -hmm. like, um, I was missing out on my son's life, but I couldn't figure out, I couldn't process how to fix it. And, um, and I tried at one point to kind of slow down again at work. And I tried to talk to my boss and we had the same conversation where it was like, okay, you know, I'm going to back off and, Things are going to change, but gradually they changed back to the way they were again. And so um, that happened to be right at the time when my husband kind of pointed out the situation. And that night I closed my laptop and I just completely separated myself from my job. And I will say that obviously this was at a school. Um, It's for anybody that's like in a teacher union, which I am in now and, you know, at before I was working at this a uh, non public school or a non a public school that wasn't in um, it was more of a charter school but when i um, when i when I look back at this, I obviously think to myself like this is a crazy thing, and even though it is in education, it's so relatable to anybody else in any type of profession right. Um, yeah, I can totally relate to that. And, um, just feeling that having that feeling of feeling trapped and, you know, or disappointing people because you've worked there so long. And like you said, you've given so much of yourself to, to that company or, you know, to that school. And yeah, I can, I can completely relate. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure there's so many, um, women out there that can relate. Um, and, but just, we, you know, at least for me, I, I don't have the, 
the courage to to just say, you know what, I'm leaving and, you know, hopefully I find something else. Right. And I never thought that I had the courage either. And I honestly don't know what happened to me that night that after my husband um, and I were in the bathroom and I was sitting on the floor with my laptop, you know, I closed it up and I kind of just kept on going with my night that night. Like we had dinner and we put my son to bed and we would read to him every night. And after that, you know, my husband and I went to bed and he fell asleep. And of course, as I was laying in bed, sometimes when, when you are, I know with me, when I'm laying in bed at night, that quiet, like that quiet time can sometimes be the loudest. You know what I mean? Like, like that's when I start thinking and because I'm laying there still, that's when my brain starts working the most. And, um, and it was that night I couldn't sleep. I kept on replaying this conversation and the situation that happened. And it was really, I saw all of my, everything that had been going on in my life kind of, um, go through my brain in a blank. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I woke my husband up, I guess it was like at three o'clock in the morning. And I said to him, I was like, I have to resign. And I got out of bed. He's, you know, he was (laughs) like out of it and he was like, what are you saying? And I said, that's it. Like I have to resign tomorrow. I totally see this. And I can't believe that I was so blind. And I got out of bed at three 15 in the morning and I typed up my resignation letter And I went in the next day and I was so nervous. And, and we were talking before this, like, I didn't think that I was going to be brave enough. I had the letter and I was shaking. And when I went to go resign, it was kind of this out of body experience where I, I just couldn't even believe the words that were coming out of my mouth. Right. I mean, it was just, I, I really could not believe how, how, where this bravery came from that 24 hours earlier, I would have never felt that way. Um, and so I ended up resigning and I gave my two weeks because I felt like that was the right thing to do. And during those two weeks, I was completely, um, like an outcast at my job. They didn't take it very well that I was leaving. And, you know, I think that it was really hard because during those 10 years that I was there, those people had, I thought become my family. Um, we were all so close and we all celebrated, you know, birthdays and special events together. We were working together so much that, um, that I just felt like they were my family. And when I resigned, I thought that maybe they would understand, but it was at that time that I realized that they were taking it so personally that they couldn't separate, um, the professional and the personal aspect of things either. And yeah. so I, I, when I resigned, I had to take a clean break and I ended up not talking to anybody that I had worked with for over two years. Um, and that was an extremely eye-opening experience. Yeah. That must've been really hard to, you know, been a part of, you know, someone's life for 10 years and then, um, you know, just, out of nowhere, um, you know, because basically you, you resign like, you know, from one day to the other, like overnight. And it must've been hard to just one day still be friends with them. And then the next day, nothing. And yeah. that happened for two years. And I feel like that's, um, I think sometimes it holds people back to, you know, quit that toxic environment because they're so close to their, um, coworkers and they just don't want to lose that, um, friendship or, you know, um, I guess feeling like family. It's right. not so much, the decision's not so much based on, you know, work itself or your bosses or something like that is based more on your coworkers, the people you right. work with. Yeah. And, um, for those two years, you know, I, 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 as we were talking prior to this podcast, one of the things that caught me off guard is when I, when I, so here I am, like I'm always a workaholic. I always have this vision of what I want to do next. And when I resigned, um, and after those two weeks, I, I realized how mentally drained and exhausted I was, how uh, my personality had changed. I wasn't the person that I really 
wanted to be. I felt like I didn't really even know myself anymore. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I just, I had no idea. And I think that that was a really tough pill for me to swallow. Like I, people were asking me like, what are you going to do now? And how, like, where, where, where are you going to go with this? And I had no answers. And so one of the things that I did was I started taking baby steps, doing things that I knew that I absolutely loved and that were going to make me happy. So obviously I started spending way more time with my son, which in itself, the first thing was that in itself was an amazing thing. The next thing that I started to do was I started to exercise, which is something that completely had dissipated during my years of, um, of work, just because I was such a workaholic that at every waking hour I was doing something for my job. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I really started to, um, fully absorb myself in reading and trying to figure out something that was going to make me happy. And that's kind of where um, later down the road, the Recipes for Happiness podcast kind of came into play because I just spent so much time researching how to cultivate happiness in my own life after this experience. Yeah, I I really like that you you started um, you know doing positive things for yourself and you know just healing you know taking that healing process um, because going back to um, you know when you quit and you know and you didn't know what you were going to do and I I just think that that's okay you know even though everyone's asking you and questioning you that you know, what are you going to do now? Because we're so used to like always having to have the answers, Mm -hmm. but I think not having the answer sometimes it's okay, especially because for 10 years you dedicated your time to, you know, to your job. And like you say, you lost yourself. So not knowing for a period of time and just finding yourself, it's okay. Because, you know, like now you're, you're so much happier and you're, you know, you're projecting happiness as opposed to just, you know, just working for someone. Right. And I think that one of the biggest mistakes that I had made when I graduated from college was to think, to think to myself, like, I have to have this career that is going to like, I'm going to live and die in this career. Like I want to start out this job and I want to work my way through and retire um, doing this job, right? Like I'm a goal setter. This is exactly what I wanted to do. But after this situation, two things occurred to me. The first one is, is that as irreplaceable as I thought that I was going to be, like, I felt like I was going to be letting every single person down at this job that I worked at. And that was part of the reason I think that I stayed there for so long was because I felt like I was irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. And it's a tough thing to swallow when you realize that, unless you own your own business, like you're replaceable. Like you don't have to worry about your job finding a replacement for you. Like that's on them. You have to live your life as best as you can because at the end of the day, when you're lying on your deathbed, those people aren't going to be around and you're not going to be sitting there thinking about all the things that you accomplished. You're going to be sitting there thinking about all the things that you, that you wish that you had. And so it's really like, that's the first thing. The second thing is that, and this, it took my husband to kind of like drill this into my head that there's always going to be a job out there for you. There's always going to be, it might take you a couple months to find something, but you're going to find something. And then actually there were three things. The third thing is that what is making you happy right now might not be making you happy. It might not make you happy in a couple years, but 
that's okay. Like you can do what you're doing right now because it's making you happy. And when you start feeling drained or overwhelmed or have that feeling in your gut that you need to move on, like you're just building upon what you've already done. And now you're going to be able to move on to something bigger and better. When one door closes, another yeah. door absolutely opens. Or a window or something opens, right? Or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like you are never stuck. Like we don't live in a country where you're ever going to be stuck. There are so many opportunities out there for everybody. And that doesn't have to even do with education. That's just if, if you're in the corporate world or if you are, you know, doing something other than education, there's always going to be a door that's opening for you. Right. And, and if, if an opportunity doesn't come to you, then you create the opportunity. Yeah. Like creating a podcast or um, opening your business, launching, you know, something, a blog or a YouTube or something. There's always something. Out yeah. There. And any type of extracurricular activity, like if you're, if you're like me and you're a workaholic and you're just married to your job all the time and you absolutely love it, maybe you're not even in a situation where you feel like it's toxic and you just absolutely love your job and everything is perfect with your career. It's also okay to have like a passion project so that you feel a little bit of balance. Like when I was at the school mm-hmm. for that 10 years, I, I was, part of the problem was that I also felt completely off balance. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't have any, I didn't make any time for myself to pursue something that was going to create a little bit of balance, whether it was writing or reading or um, painting or whatever it is, you know, whatever you're into, like just do something that can create a little bit of balance in your life. Right. Because you weren't, um, you didn't have the time to, to do, you know, some self care and do something that you really, really enjoy. Not to say that you don't enjoy your job, but, you know, just to have that, you know, extracurricular activity, like you said, or, you know, painting, writing, whatever that is, not be consumed by your job 24 seven. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I just, for anybody out there that it feels like they're off balance between their job and their personal life, or maybe you're a parent and you feel like you are off balance between your job and your personal life, or maybe you're single and you, and you feel that way too. It doesn't matter. Like if you feel off balance, which is something I feel like is so common these days, because it's so easy to not have any separation, right? Like with email and cell phones and just having the technology that we have every day. And especially right now during coronavirus, where a lot of people are working from home, it's so hard to take that separation there. It's it's really hard to create it. And it's so important to do that. It really is. Yes. I can, I can um, say that when this whole COVID-19 happened and I started working um, full-time from home, the first month was so hard because I wasn't, um, you know, time blocking. I wasn't, um, you know, just separating work and my personal life. So I was just, you know, just because I was home, I was just working the entire time and it was stressing me out. Um, yeah. But the second I, you know, start started time blocking and saying, okay, from this time to this time, I'm doing work. And then this time to this time, I'm doing something personal or, you know, working out or some self-care and it changed. And now like, you know, I just work from this time to this time and that's it. Yeah. And that's so, that's so amazing. I think it's very important for, um, to draw that line, you know? I I 100% agree. And just remember that if you get an email during, you know, the evenings or on the weekends, you don't have to answer it right away. Like it can wait until tomorrow or it can wait until Monday. And that is okay. And I think that it's important for people to hear that. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Um, So can you tell us a little bit about your your podcast? Um, Sure. So through this whole experience, um, I had this idea of, of having a podcast and it's called Recipes for Happiness. 
And I started it back in March. So it was right at the beginning of this whole coronavirus situation. And I actually had thought about it for about two and a half years before I actually implemented it. And, um, and I just absolutely love it. It's all tips and advice about how to cultivate happiness in your own life. It doesn't necessarily have to do with what we're talking about today, but it really just has to do with finding balance and cultivating happiness in your life. Um, yeah, it, it maybe not exactly um, have to do with what we're talking about, yeah. but I think it's important that, um, that because you decided to leave that toxic environment, yeah, you open yourself up to new things. And one of them was this podcast for yourself exactly. you know, to feel happy and to feel fulfilled and, but also to share that with other people. Yes. And that is, you, you hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly why I started it. So I think, um, you know, I'm just going back with that. Um, I think it's important that if, you know, you feel like you're trapped or you're, you, you know, you feel like you're in a toxic environment and, and you want to leave, it's okay because you never know where that will take you. That decision exactly. will take you, you know, to something, you know, more amazing that you you, you probably didn't ever think about. Right. And one of the things that I kind of, I always say Jedi mind trick, like I was talking myself out. I can be my own worst enemy. I don't know. I'm sure that other people out there feel that way too. Yes. But one of the scariest things for me was I kept on thinking to myself, like I've been at this job for 10 years. And when I leave, who's going to want me? Like when I leave, who's going to say like, oh, she's been at this job for 10 years. We really want her to come and work for us. I felt like I was going to have such a hard time finding another job, but it was, it was completely the opposite. When I left there and when I went to go interview, people looked at this and they said, Oh my gosh, she's loyal. Oh my goodness. Look at all of, because even though we're sitting here talking about the negative aspects of things, I was able to gain so much knowledge about education when I worked there. So I was very marketable, way more marketable than like the bad voice in my head saying you need to stay (laughs) where you are because you've been there for 10 years and you're not marketable at all. It was completely the opposite. So just if you're on the fence, if you're questioning it, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. You might not have doors open right away, but, um, but just keep your head up and, and keep going. It's that um, imposter syndrome that yes. I feel like everyone at some point deals with, right? Not, yes. you know, not feeling like you know enough or not feeling like you're worth, um, you know, like for you going to another job, applying for another job, just because yeah. you've been there for so long. Right. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, come on, come on over um, and listen to happiness of, or I'm sorry, recipes for happiness. And (laughs) I would love to have you guys as listeners. So yes, please go, go listen to her (laughs) her podcast. It's so positive and um, she gives great tips for, you know, to stay happy. And thank you so much, Anel, for having me on the show today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your story. That's very brave of you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this episode inspired you. If you like this podcast, please share on social media and tag me on Instagram at the brave and her. I would love to hear your stories of bravery.